All right, welcome back uh, to the Sailing Doodles podcast. Uh, changing things up a little bit now with this. I'm going to start a new segment every week. I kind of give you the sailing news. So I may even rename, sorry about the dog. Oh my gosh. So I may even rename the uh, podcast from maybe like the Sailing News podcast or something like that. Or maybe just the Bobby White podcast because, you know, maybe I don't want to always just cover sailing topics. But one segment I am going to do is give you some sailing news. So every week I'm going to give you some sailing news. Uh, I cover everything from what's going on uh, race-wise, tech-wise, cruising-wise, and then I'm also going to give you some updates uh, with what's going on with some of the other YouTube channels like our own and uh, some of the bigger names that you might know. Kind of give you an update in case you haven't followed along for a while what they've got going on. So my first topic today here, we're talking the Vendee Globes. If you've never heard of that, imagine a race where you're completely on your own, battling the world's toughest seas without any stops or help. Uh, that's the Vendee Globe in a nutshell. It, it, in a nutshell, It's a solo, nonstop, unassisted, around-the-world yacht race that kicks off from uh, Les, France. I don't know how to say the place, Les Sables d'Aon, whatever, France. And they do this every four years. Here's a lowdown. Um, it's solo and unassisted. Every sailor must navigate roughly 2,400 nautical miles uh, of the journey alone. There are no pit stops, no crews to lean on, and absolutely no external ass external assistance. It's just you and your boat uh, and the unpredictable ocean. You can stop uh, to get repairs done in certain places, but everything else has to be unassisted. It's the ultimate test. It's dubbed the Everest of the Seas. This race pushes sailors to their absolute limits. Uh, most of the course is set in the brutal southern ocean, thinking massive waves, uh, bone-chilling cold, and ferocious storms. I mean, sometimes they have 40, 50-foot seas out there, and it's huge. Uh, a legacy of innovation. The race has evolved dramatically since its inception in 1989 by French yachtsman Philippe Gentil. Gentil? I don't know how you say that. I'm not good with French names. I apologize. Uh, early editions featured older IMOC, IMOCA models, um, but today's competitors use state-of-the-art IMOCA 60s, complete with hydraulic foils that boost speed and efficiency uh, i've seen these i've seen the race they average i think they average something like 17 or 18 knots around the world and you know they hit 30 40 knots sometimes on these sailing you know monoholes um a little history the vending club started in 1989 um and uh, the first edition saw 13 sailors set off. Roughly seven, seven managed to finish. Uh, since then, the race has become legendary, with French uh, sailors dominating the podium uh, for decades. Icons like uh, Tétion, Le Mazou, uh, Michel, I'm not even going to pronounce that last name, some others. I don't know the French names, whatever. Pushing the limits of what's possible under the open ocean. Uh, not only is the Vendée Globe uh, challenge sailors, but also drives cutting-edge advancements in yacht design and maritime safety. Every yacht is a showcase of human perseverance, innovation, and the raw power of nature. And the 2024, uh, 2025, uh, so it, it happened, I think it starts in October or November. Anyway, and it lasts about uh, a couple months. Uh, so that may, maybe starts in December. I'm not sure because it's summer in the Southern Ocean. They need to do it then. Vendée Globe uh, French skipper Charlie Dallin uh, aboard the Massif Santé Persevoyance clinched the win with an astounding overall time of 64 days, 19 hours, and 22 minutes, and 49 seconds, smashing the previous record by over nine days and eight hours. Uh, I mean, that's just crazy. Nine days since the last one. During a critical evening stretch, uh, the 24-hour distance record was broken by Nicholas uh, Lavoon, set an initial mark of 54 mile, 554 miles in one 24-hour period. Then Dolan improved that the next day to 50, 558 miles, followed by Thomas Rayant reaching 571 miles in one single 24-hour period. Uh, and then uh, Johan Richmond pushed it even further, 574.7 miles in 24 hours. Truly astonishing how fast these boats can go. Uh, Charlie uh, Dallin established three new intermediate records over the race. Uh, he From the equator to the Cape of Good Hope in seven days and 19 hours. From the Cape of Good Hope to Cape Lewin in nine days, 22 hours. And then... Uh, the uh, uh, the equator back to France in eight days, 16 hours. Pretty amazing. One thing that's been the rage for the past few years is AI, artificial intelligence. And it's coming to the boating world, whether we like it or not. Some people are pretty old school about it. But uh, there is definitely AI in boating. I'm going to start one of the first topics. I'm going to start with that is Raymarine's dock sense system. Uh, so... Uh, 
it's there's a lot of other self docking uh, technologies, but Raymarine has one of the first. DockSense uses a set of small, high re resolution cameras mounted around the hull to generate a continuous 360 degree view. This live feed is combined with the boat's GPS sensors, attitude sensors to create a virtual bumper around your boat. When you are approaching a dock or maneuvering in a tight space, the system monitors your proximity to obstacles and can automatically adjust throttle and steering via the autopilot to keep you safe and on course. Uh, DockSense is currently available and is offered part of Raymarine's suite of marine electronics and is available on many new production yachts as well as select retrofit projects. So this is mostly new yachts. While the exact pricing may vary from boat configuration and dealer, the package typically range between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. It's best suited for recreational cruising, cru uh, cruising yachts from thirty to sixty feet. Uh, many modern sail and motor yachts equipped with integrated autopilots are ideal candidates. Other self-docking systems would be Volvo Penta's assisting docking. Um, rather than relying on external cameras, Volvo Penta's system is built into the vehicle's electronic vessel control and dynamic positioning system. Uh, the skipper sets a desired course and speed via joystick, and the system continuously adjusts engine thrust and rudder angles to counteract wind and drift and current. Um, the, the system is available on new boats equipped with the Volvo Penta IPS drives and is typically bundled as part of the overall engine and control package. The exact pricing is generally integrated into the boat's total cost. That system is more on motor yachts and high-performance cruisers that use the Volvo Penta system. Another system is the Avicus New Boat Dock. Uh, the New Boat takes an autonomous docking a step further by integrating multiple 360-degree cameras, LIDAR, uh, you know, it's like radar but with lasers, and even thermal sensors. The system processes the, the data through an onboard AI offering a dynamic, dynamic bird's eye view of the docking environment with augmented reality overlays that highlight obstacles and guide the vessel into the berth. Avicus New Boat Dock is available as OEM equipment on new builds with some retrofitting options emerging as the technology matures. Pricing for the AI system, system um, from Avicus uh, can be widely, very widely from around $10,000 for the entry level up to $40,000 for the more advanced levels. And then there is a software licensing fee which can be around $1,000. So, you know, you're going to get hit with that. Um, New Boat is designed for a range of recreational vessels, especially those in the mid-size category, 30 to 60 feet, uh, where integrating multiple sensors and a dedicated AI, process, AI processor is both feasible and beneficial. Uh, there are some emerging systems from Brunswick and Yamaha. Um, what's on the horizon? Brunswick is developing an autonomous docking system for some of its popular models, certain like Boston Whaler and Sea Ray boats. And Yamaha is working on an outboard-based system that uses onboard sensors to assist in docking. Uh, these systems are in the advanced stages of development and are expected to be integrated into new boats over the next year. Pricing details are still emerging. But early estimates suggest they will be competitive with the other high-end docking systems in the ten dollars to $20,000 range. They are targeted at recreational cruising boats that are already on the cutting edge of technology, including both sail and motor yachts. You know, these systems reduce stress and workload of docking, a maneuver that can be done that can be nerve-wracking even for experienced sailors. I think that's a thing that most people uh, getting into sailing have a problem with is, I mean, that's probably the most difficult thing people do is not sailing and all that, it's docking the boat. And this makes that a lot easier. So it might make people a little more uh, uh, less apprehensive about getting into sailing. They can prevent collisions by reacting faster than human than a human might in low visibility conditions or when distracted. They're designed to be part of a broader integrated navigation suite, so they enhance safety. The human operator can always override the system if needed. Together, these autonomous systems assisted docking systems, making it easier and safer for boaters to handle one of the most challenging aspects of boating. Whether you're a seasoned cruiser or a new boater, integrating such technology can greatly improve your experience by streamlining dock procedures and reducing the risk of accidents. Another race that actually happened last year, but there's been some recent fighting just in the last few days by the race committee, is the 2024 Newport Bermuda race. It was one for the books with challenging conditions, fierce competitions, and some serious lessons in offshore sailing. But what made this year stand out? Three abandoned vessels, multiple rescues, and a major safety review that could change the future of the race. So let's break it all down. On June 21st, 2024, 162 boats with 1,400 sailors set off from the Newport, Rhode Island, from Newport, Rhode Island, on the 634, 635 nautical mile journey between Ber to Bermuda. A race filled with intense competition, high seas, and unfortunately serious incidents that forced multiple crews to abandon ship. But what really happened out there?
First up, Alliance, a 46-foot sloop, faced catastrophic rudder failure on June 23rd. The crew was sailing at full tilt when suddenly the rudder stock cracked, causing uncontrollable water ingress. The flooding was too severe to contain, forcing all nine crew members to abandon ship into their life raft. Fortunately, the racing yacht Celida was nearby and took them safely on board. Alliance was left to the sea. Next, Gunga Den, a Swedish 41, was about 80 miles from Bermuda when disaster struck. The boat started taking on water rapidly, but the exact cause remains unclear, possibly a hull or keel bolt failure. Uh, with the water pump water levels rising fast and the pumps were unable to keep up, the crew made the decision to abandon ship. Uh, the nearby boat Desna responded and successfully rescued all seven sailors. Finally, the most dramatic incident happened after the race. On July 2nd, when heading, while heading home back to the U.S., the 50-foot sloop Solution suffered a severe structural failure 200 miles south of Cape Cod. The hull was compromised, possibly due to prolonged stress from the race conditions, and water flooded in at an uncontrollable rate. The crew set out a distress call, and within hours, the U.S. Coast Guard airlifted all crew members to safety. Solution was lost at sea. With three serious incidents to the Bermuda Race Organizing Committee, the BROC, along with the U.S. Sailing, uh, the U.S. Sailing and Cruising Club of America, conducted an in-depth safety review. Their findings: preparation and training save lives. The crews of Alliance, Gunga Den, and Solution followed proper abandonment protocols, providing that emergency drills and offshore safety courses are essential. The report also stressed the importance of structural structural integrity checks before long offshore passages. Rudder stocks, hull seams, keel bolts need more rigorous inspections, especially for boats seeing high offshore stress. Moving forward, the race may introduce stricter pre-race safety requirements. The 2024 Newport Bermuda race was a stark reminder of the power of the ocean. While competition is fierce, safety always comes first. The good news, every single sailor involved in these incidents made it home safe. And thanks to the race committee's safety review, future races will even be even more prepared. So what do you think? Should offshore races have stricter safety measures? Let me know in the comments. For now for some YouTube sailing updates. I plan on doing this every week. I'll go over some of the top or uh, maybe even some of the newer YouTube channels, kind of give you an idea what's going on in case you haven't watched the videos in a while. Sailing La Vagabond has been on an incredible journey over the past few months. Sailing to Japan, dealing with a serious collision, and planning for the future. Let's break it all down and see what's next for Riley, Elena, and the crew. In mid-2024, Riley, Elena, and their kids took one of their most ambitious voyages yet, sailing all the way to Japan. From navigating volcanic islands to experiencing some of the most stunning coastlines in the world, they've shared some incredible moments, moments of their, with their viewers, but not everything went as planned. In November, while anchored near a Japanese fishing port, disaster struck. A local fishing boat collided with La Vagabond in the early morning hours, causing significant damage to the forward beam of the structural components. Luckily, everyone aboard was safe, but the damage was serious enough enough to force them into an emergency repair situation. After assessing the damage, Riley and Elena had no choice but to haul out the boat for the repairs, working closely with the Rapido Trimaran's team to get the, her seaworthy again. But what does this mean for their future plans? Repairs have been extensive, with a brand new forward beam being installed. During this time, Riley and Elena have been reflecting on their journey and thinking about what's next for sailing a vagabond. While they haven't revealed all their details yet, it's clear that 2025 is going to be a big year. Uh, will they continue pushing the limits of offshore sailing? Uh, will they explore no, new destination? One thing's for sure, there's never a dull moment aboard La Vagabond. All right, I'm kind of doing these in order by uh, subscribers. So number two would be a Sailing SV Delos. All right, Delos Tribe, it's been an action-packed few months for SV Delos crew from building a brand new aluminum catamaran to bidding farewell to the original Delos. Let's dive into their latest chapters of their incredible journey. Earlier this year, Brian and Karen and the team embarked on an ambitious project, constructing their very own aluminum expedition catamaran, documenting every step they've shared, the highs and the lows of building this boat. From the initial framework to the intricate uh, systems, they're doing it all. It's been a massive undertaking, but their dedication is turning this dream into reality. This state-of-the-art aluminum catamaran is designed for sustainable and off-grid living, equipped with the latest technology to explore the world's oceans responsibly. The excitement is palpable as they prepare for new adventures on this remarkable vessel. So what's next on the horizon for uh, SV Delos and crew? With their new catamaran, they're gearing up for expeditions to uncharted territories, embracing fresh challenges, and of course, sharing it all with the Delos tribe. Stay tuned for more sailing adventures, cultural explorations and the unyielding spirit of life at sea. Up next on the YouTube sailing world would be Sailing Doodles. I, uh, I'm kind of familiar with Sailing Doodles. That would be uh, the show that I host if I don't know how you would if you're watching the Sailing Doodles podcast you probably know who Sailing Doodles is. 
But a lot has happened with us in, in the past year. Uh, so I'll kind of give you some you know, quick updates with that. We had a brand new hybrid electric catamaran built in Thailand. We traveled to Thailand in October and did the sea trials and we're very excited about the boat. They had to do a few more last preparations and then they were going to ship the boat and it was going to be at the Miami Boat Show just a few weeks ago. So they had the boat all finished, and they were sailing it. They hired a, a delivery crew to sail the boat from Thailand down to Singapore uh, through uh, several different added-up errors. It's never just one thing. They started taking on water through what we think was a, a leaking shaft seal. The bilge pumps were holding it up with it, but uh, eventually got the CAN bus wet, which shuts the engines down. But they were still sailing, and then they were sailing to a shipyard where they could get work done Unfortunately, uh, they never made it to the shipyard. It's still kind of unknown exactly why things happened. They kind of anchored in a bad place. Maybe didn't put out enough co anchor chain. Don't know for sure everything, but the boat ended up washed up on shore and stayed on the beach for more than two weeks uh, in the pounding surf with uh, six to nine foot tides and the seas that came with it totally flooding the hole. Uh, I'm still dealing with insurance right now. I'm hoping that keeps progressing because that's a lot of money I've got wrapped up in that boat. But hopefully something will happen soon. I'm hopeful. And anyway, so that's it now. The boat is still in Malaysia on the beach. Never made it on the made, never made it to the cargo ship in Singapore to be shipped over to the U.S. So in the interim, I, I am talking to Island Spirit about getting a new catamaran from them but it's going to be at least another year before that happens so in the interim i bought this boat back this is my old 1989 ct56 that i sailed for two years and then sold after i had a transmission fire it was easily fixable but i didn't want to spend six months in a yard that's just not really my cup of tea for filming or working and so i sold it to a guy he did some of the refurbishments i've got the boat back now and i'm kind of you know taking care of her again. So we are sailing down the east coast of the United States right now, about to hop over to the Bahamas. Really looking forward to that because we're tired of this cold weather. So we're in Florida right now. We're going to be crossing over to the Bahamas pretty soon. So uh, that is what's going on. Uh, and actually, uh, you want to check out, there's something that I can't say yet that has happened very s recently um, to Sailing Doodles. That video will be out this Sunday. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed to the Sailing Doodles channel and uh, you'll get all the information about that. Actually, our uh, Sailing Doodles Navy, if you want to go to sailingdoodles.podia.com, they've already got the scoop on that. So it's kind of a big deal. Uh, so if you like that, then you want to get early access to the videos and some behind-the-scenes footage, please consider the Sailing Doodles Navy. With that, uh, thank you for watching the Sailing Doodles, or the the Bobby White, yeah, you know what, I don't know what I'm going to name this. Why don't you leave me a, a, link, a comment down in the description. What do you think I should rename this podcast? I... I do think I should kind of stay in the sailing realm because I've tried doing different topics like I did, uh, you know, the, I, I interviewed an astronaut. I interviewed uh, Rick, uh, I forget his last name or anyway, he was Dob Rick Doblin about his, uh, what was it, his uh, PTSD therapy with MDMA. Those videos didn't really do well, so I think I might should stick to the sailing style of things or things I'm very interested in. So maybe something like that, but it's not really necessarily just about sailing doodles anymore. I want to make it about the sailing world and news and stuff like that and just topics and people that I'm interested in. So leave me a comment down below. What do you think I should rename the channel and the podcast? Thank you for watching. Please make sure you're subscribed to this channel, whatever the name may be. And, uh, you know, I'm going to try to do at least one of these a week. And so I'm going to do the news, but then I'm also going to do when I can get interviews with other people, I'll do those as well. So thanks, guys. We'll see you.